Um, good evening and welcome to the Cape Elizabeth School Board meeting for Tuesday, December 12th, year 2000. And we'll start uh, with the first item on the agenda, which is the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for I know that we do have a couple of um, adjustments to the agenda. I would like to um, suggest that um, th we do have a student matter which re requires a public motion, and I'd like to put that under new business 13, item 13, and it would be A, um, with all of those other items moving down a slot, B, C, D, and E. And Kevin, I think um, there you had another adjustment. I have, uh actually three adjustments. Under uh, committee reports, I would like to add D, Portland Arts and Technical High School. Under 13, new business F, adoption of the part two budget for Portland Arts and Technical High School. And under 13, new business G, um, a vote to approve an amendment to the Constitution of Portland Arts and Technical High School as relates to the timeline for budgets. Okay. Um, are there other adjustments that need to be made to the, the agenda for this evening? Seeing none, we're going to move on to approval of the November school board minutes. Any changes required there? So you know, I'm going to move on and um, we'll invite our high school representatives, representative. Hi. Hi. Um, in SAC this week, we, dis uh, we developed the elective subcommittee and they are going to be meeting with teachers to talk about um, instituting new electives into the curriculum and how they would be taught who would be teaching them, what kind of facilities would be necessary for these new electives that the students have said that they wanted to have. Um, we have also decided to do a number of charitable uh, contributions to the community um, as an SAC. We are participating in the Toys for Tots program and we're going to be collecting um, five to ten dollar small generic toys at school that we can then bring to hospital to the hospital and to the root cellar. Uh, we will also be uh, adopting a family that we are going to be providing a Christmas dinner and presents for. We are working at Twilight in the Park this Sunday which benefits terminally ill patients and we have a number of students who are going to be participating in that. And our sports teams have been up and running for the winter season, and they're all looking pretty good this year. And that's about all that's going on in the high school. Good. Sounds like a lot of good things. Are there questions or comments? Uh, what, what exactly is Twilight in the Park? Um, it's an organization where there's lighting of about 1,000 candles. L luminaries and, or something? Yeah. That's it's the main hospice. The okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, put on by the hospice and people come and they ice skate and they hang out and they have d like art and crafts. Yeah. yeah. And so it's going to be a lot of fun if you don't want to come. Other questions? Comments? We're all set. Thank you very much. Good job. Uh, we'll move on to comments from our middle school students. Good evening, and um, I will be talking about the fifth and sixth graders um, in the middle school. Um, the, the D.A.R.E. program has ended for the fifth grade, and um, we had a book fair last week, and they also had a lot of fun there. Um, that's pretty much it for the fifth grade, um, and they're also getting started in the student council uh, lately. And um, uh, the sixth grade had, had also gone to the book fair um, 
last week, and they also had a lot of fun there too. Um, but there's really nothing much going on in the fifth and sixth grade except just like daily, um, regular, just what normal days are like. Just um, the eighth grade and the seventh grade are pretty much just taking part in fundraising right now. Um, the eighth graders are doing shoeboxes for kids, the Salvation Army, and they're also sponsoring an Adopt-A-Family program through the Salvation Army, and um, our December 8th dance is a success, so that's about it. That's great. Any um, questions for our middle school representatives? Thank you very much for the update. I'm um, going to move on now to communications, and um, is this an item, Tom, that you have? I just wanted to, there was a lot of discussion, I know, last year about the um, criminal records history check, um, and I've included in the packet an update uh, from the commissioner and to also let you know that here at Cape Elizabeth, we're in, in great shape as far as our um, teachers and ed techs. Um, there still seems to be some uncertainty as to um, what the state, how the state is pursuing and, and what our obligation is as far as coaches um, and where we stand with that. And substitute teachers have been, giving, uh, have been given a, until next year, I think, for that to happen with substitutes. But as far as our professional staff, um, the people whose certification is up, we are right on top of all those people and are up, up to date on those. Great. Um, other communications, Jim, did you have something? Mr. Chairman, I'd like to uh, call the board's attention to a draft letter that I included, included in everybody's packet. Um, it's a draft letter that I propose to send to uh, newly elected state congresswoman uh, Janet McLaughlin. This is in response to her communication with Tom asking about issues or areas uh, where she might work uh, to help our school district and Augusta. Um, I would like the board to know that I've cleaned up some of the uh, Faulknerian stream of conscious wordiness <laughs> in the draft that you had. <laughs> It's a little cleaner than, than what I gave you, but uh, the content remains the same. And that's, uh, although we don't need any formal action tonight, I'd just like uh, to have the board's uh, input on any additions that they would like to see made to that letter. Comments? Uh, yeah, Jim, the only, I don't know if you want to mention this or not, but um, in the second part of that, one of the states, I think, is Massachusetts. You might want to. As a reference. Just um, stick that in there for her. I will do that. Uh, for, the, for the audience's uh, information, uh, I identified two areas where I thought she might be helpful in Augusta. One was to protect the uh, financial interests of our district uh, come budget time, and the other area was uh, that she might consider uh, enacting or sponsoring legislation that would better define a school district's uh, duty in educate, providing edu public education for somebody who might be under indictment uh, or charged with a, with a serious or violent crime but is awaiting trial. Um, obviously, this comes out of our student issue of last year, and such direction from the state would have been pretty helpful. Yep. Jim, I think you're right on target. I'd like to suggest, however, that that letter also go out to our, the other representative uh, who, I'm not sure exactly who that is, who's representing a smaller part of Cape as well as our new state senator. Uh, I think we need to get as many people on board with us as possible. And I would like to acknowledge that uh, Representative McLaughlin came to us and said, what can I do to help, which is uh, quite refreshing. I'll do that, Kevin. Just in terms of asking for support on those, on those items from the other reps. It was a good, good letter. I didn't notice any, um, any ramblings, but I think <laughs> yeah. well, it was pretty good. Other comments? Um, okay. Then uh, comments from the public? Seeing none, we'll move on to recognition. Tom? We do have one uh, recognition, and, and unfortunately, the person being recognized was uh, a bit concerned with the weather and the freezing of the, the rain, and her, her trip home uh, does live uh, quite a ways away. So, um, But I would still like to um, read um, our certificate that that is going to be presented to Sharon Merrill. Uh, Sharon has been very active in her national organization, um, which really, and especially in the guidance area, is something that, 
that benefits Cape Elizabeth with that knowledge base on a, on a national level. Um, and the certificate reads, the Cape Elizabeth School Board presents this award for outstanding accomplishment to Sharon Merrill in recognition of your ongoing involvement and contribution as an assembly delegate to the National Conference of the National Association for College Counseling and a member of the NEACAC Governing Board in appreciation for the Cape Elizabeth School Board, signed George Antoine Solon Thomas Russell, Superintendent. Um, and the letter that is in your packet uh, really does pinpoint their, their um, appreciation that as a school district we do allow um, her, and, and that's something that I think we would do for anyone, their participation in their professional organization at, at a national level. Okay. We congratulate Sharon on that recognition. Pete? Sure. I'll say something quickly because Sharon did ask me when she realized that uh, she was feeling uneasy about uh, staying. She did ask if I could uh, convey to you her appreciation for uh, the support that the school system uh, does show her in allowing her to be involved in that. And I think Dr. Priscilla mentioned a very important point is this is one of those, it's two-sided, it's a, a recognition uh, and it's an honor for her to be on the national delegate to the National Assembly, but it very directly um, uh, positively impacts our students, the, the quality of the information that they receive about uh, college admissions is greatly enhanced by the fact that Sharon is in touch um, with uh, the, uh, this national organization and constantly meeting with uh, representatives from various colleges and comes back with the, the best information available. So it, it's a, a recognition for her, but it also ends up benefiting our students, I think, uh, in a very real way. That's good. Thank you. Tom, you've still got the floor here. Okay. Um, as is usually on the agenda, um, an update on future direction action teams. Um, the, all of the action teams have been meeting. They met for a full day on November 21st with the goal of creating draft objectives, um, which would then um, lead into the very specific actions. Uh, they made quite a bit of progress. In January, they will be having uh, input sessions uh, with uh, school administrators and with parents. Another activity around future direction planning that um, I wanted to share with you um, is an activity that the staff is, is involved with, and that's to look at our, the belief statements that were created. Um, I had an opportunity also to meet with a group of middle school parents this morning and get input from them regarding how they feel we're doing as far as our beliefs. Uh, my hope with this is that as we've created a mission and a vision and belief statements, in order to keep them alive, we need to constantly revisit them, reflect on them, and take a look at what is going on in our schools and in, within our classrooms um, that ties into what, to what our beliefs are. So I'm just going to pass out um, to you um, what I call beliefs into practice. This will also be in the Pond Cove um, parents newsletter and probably the middle school too. I think they decided today, they said they would do that um, because our attempt is to get input um, from parents as to how they feel we're doing as, as far as our belief statements and if these are things that we truly believe in in our school district, for example, one of them is that all students can learn. Um, what's the evidence that that's happening um, and what do they see happening as parents and, and it's something also we're asking um, faculty to do is to take a, to, to reflect on the kinds of practices and the things that are happening in their classrooms and give that feedback to us. My hope is then to take all of this information and just simply to get it back to staff um, and to parents to say these are, the, these are the kinds of things that are happening that really demonstrate our beliefs are, are things we, we truly do practice um, within our classrooms. Um, as, as you know, when we create new missions, visions, belief statements, and long-range planning, the most difficult piece that school districts run into is keeping those plans alive, keeping the mission alive, the vision alive and the, and the beliefs. Um, so this is something that I, that I hope we can continue to get people to reflect on what the kinds of things that we, we said are important to us. Um, I'll skip over, Gary, the uh, te technology committee and come back to that. 
Um, just to finish out my, my piece of this report, um, we talked early on in this school year um, that a goal of mine was to investigate the possibility of creating an education foundation um, for Cape Elizabeth. Um, the group, there is a group that has had an initial meeting. Um, it's a small group, but a very enthusiastic group. Um, their goal uh, right now is to look at the kinds of things that might need to be done that they can support the schools that are outside of things that normally happen within our budget. So it isn't something that would um, take away from our normal budget, but those kinds of activities that quite often our booster groups are fundraising for, um, but never seem to be able to, to complete that project. Um, they, are, they have had conversations with, as I have had with similar organizations in, in surrounding communities. Um, they will be meeting tomorrow night to uh, establish what their purpose is, begin to create a mission statement, and then to organize themselves as far as the legal aspects of what they have to do in, in creating those documents. Um, their hope is to call upon a lot of the expertise that's already in the community. Um, David Unger, a parent, has agreed uh, to initially chair this group. He has a, a wealth of experience in this area. Um, and we have quite a few parents that have background um, in either as uh, fundraising for, for nonprofit groups or similar kinds of activities. And it really looks like something that, that has a lot of potential. Um, but we don't know all the specifics yet, but I think it could be a very exciting kind of initiative. And again, it's the school district taking uh, a look at alternative sources of funding. Um, as we know, as we get into the budget, um, it can be a difficult time because increases are never easy. Um, I think this is a demonstration of our willingness to say, are there other ways that we can begin to look at helping to fund our schools um, aside from just looking at our, our normal operating budget and maybe some of those other kinds of things we can do through, through a, another arena. Um, so I'll keep you up, up to date. Uh, and there is a meeting for anyone who is interested. They're looking for all the help they can get uh, at the Pond Cove um, Media Center um, at 7 o'clock tomorrow evening. Any questions on the foundation? And Gary Lenoy um, is here this evening uh, for the annual report from the Technology Committee. Would we move, Gary? Is it easiest for us to come down? Do you want us to come down? Do you have a paper copy of, of a report that has the copies of these PowerPoint slides and some other additional information? Um, each year in December, uh, give you kind of an update of, as to where we are with technology, and, and that's what this is all about tonight. Uh, you'll notice that there's pictures of the technology, but there's also pictures of, of the students using that technology, and that's what it's all about. It's not about the things that we have, but how is it uh, making an impact on, on the students and, and learning. These are uh, key areas to our technology plan, the steering committee, networking, hardware, software, those kinds of things, those are categories, and I'll touch on a few of those as we get down through in, in individual slides. Uh, the technology committee meets monthly during the school year, and it, it guides the direction, the vision of technology in our schools. It's actually a town school committee. We have town representatives on it as well. Um, they update the plan yearly, and uh, last year we spent a lot of time revising the, the AUP, the acceptable use policies, 
which you people adopted in, in last spring. The revised acceptable use policies were distributed to all students at the beginning of the school year, and as a result of that, it was always a, kind of a, a real tough challenge to keep track of who has acceptable use in, to use the internet and those kinds of things. Well, we're using the technology to, to track that now. Uh, students are using the networks, they log into a server, they have a, a space on the server to store all their documents. Uh, and for example, in the high school, it doesn't matter whether you're in the Mac lab, you're in the Windows lab, you log into the same server and your documents are there. And because we use software like the Office platform, it's uh, completely um, invisible as far as moving back and forth between the two platforms. We control who has access to the internet by putting in a group. We have an internet group, we have a non-internet group. And if they've turned in the paperwork, then they get placed in the, the internet group. The goal is not to block everyone out of the, the internet. If a, if a teacher goes in with a class activity, a guided activity, we have ways to get around that so that everyone can have access. Uh, but that's how we're, we're using that. We're using the technology to help us track some of those things. Some of the other new things as far as networking, <clears throat> uh, thin clients technology. You may have hear about this from the governor's laptop proposals or thin client proposals. We're doing a form of that in that we're, uh, we're booting up the middle school lab off of uh, a server. The, what, what's neat about that for me is that we build one hard drive on the server and get all the software upgraded and, and set just exactly the way we want and then the, the computers in the, uh, in the lab go and get that image. So if I need to update things, I'm updating, updating one image instead of 25 different computers. Um, we're also delivering applications by way of servers at the high school. So those students in the internet group at the high school get Netscape when they log in. Those students that don't uh, have acceptable uses turned in, policies turned in don't get it. Uh, so we're using the network to do more and more uh, of delivering applications and controlling what we're doing. Another new thing added to the network this year was a firewall. Now, you may not know what a firewall is, but it's a basically it's a box designed to pre prevent unauthorized access to and from our network. If this here is our school network, this little box is the firewall, uh, and out there is the, the world. We have a public network and a private network, so it's kind of a little dividing place, pay, place in the network. We didn't have that before. Uh, it does offer us some added protection. Is it foolproof? No. I mean, there are people who can hack, hack into big uh, corporate network, so I'm sure if somebody really wanted to, they could get into ours. But it's it's a protection and, and something that we have in place that we didn't have before. We've been receiving our internet connection through MSLN, Main State Library Network. Uh, that started mm, five, six years ago. Uh, we have a free T1 internet connection, and all of our schools connect by way of fiber to that all with the exception of the high school. I'm not sure if you're, you're aware right now, we had a little uh, incident where a worker cut the fiber cable that goes down to the high school, so the high school is, is isolated and cut off from the network right now, and we're working on getting that fixed. But the goal was to have one big internet connection and share it with all the schools. And we did, we did have that, and we, we will have that again. The, uh, MSLN project will end in June of 2001, and I fully expected that we would be paying something for our internet connection after that. The state has come up with a, an MSLN 2 project that's going to be its replacement, and they plan on providing the same level of internet service, and uh, we're expected to use a combination of E-rate and state funding, and that T1 can continue to be free for us. So our internet connection that at that level can remain free for us to the successor plan of MSLN. We've been, this chart doesn't show up real well, but it, uh, to throw out some figures at it, a T1 connection is 1.5 megabits or 1,500 kilobits. This little chart, the number here is 700. 700 is roughly half of that. And there are some days 
in the month where we peak at about half or using half of the T1. So we are using it. This is a chart that MSLN can provide me for the month of November. And it charts the, the, the traffic to and from our site um, for each day. And we are getting up there halfway uh, on some days. We're looking at the possibility of an ATM connection for next year. I've actually have gone and done some preliminary work for that. Uh, ATM is the main distance learning project. Uh, it, it provides real-time interactive voice, video, and data over telephone networks. It's, remember I said a T1 was 1.5 megabits? Uh, an ATM is 45 megabits. Of that, we can use 10 for data, 10 for internet stuff. The rest of it is the voice and the video. Uh, with this project, there was a bond several years ago, $110,000 worth of networking and video equipment and training is provided to the district through this project at, at no cost. That's all funded by the state. Many local districts are using or are planning to use ATM. Yarmouth and Thornton Academy just got connected just sh shortly. Falmouth is planning on, on, on using this as their internet connection and doing some of the, the video and data stuff. The district's responsibilities really are involve a classroom at the high school. We have to have a physical room um, and provide eventually to provide content for the ATM network and the technical support staff. I, I've attended ATM meetings where I go to Gorham High School because that's the closest site for me. But there's this video monitor and it's divided into quarters. And in one quarter you have Gorham, another quarter you have Augusta, and then Bangor, and then maybe someplace else. So four sites. And the meeting is held, you go to your closest site, and the meeting is held uh, over this network. And the video and the data is live. There's a a plan to use this same type of technology for offering classrooms and instructional things for maybe specialized content where you could combine a, a real specialized course and maybe combine three or four high schools in the area and deliver a course by way of this network. ATM costs, what's the bottom line? It's expensive. That would uh, roughly equal somewhere around $25,000 a year for ATM. With our E-rate subsidy, we fall, E-rate subsidy is based upon your free and reduced hot lunch counts. We fall in the 40% category because of, of our count number. So we'd get a discount of 830 per month. And then we'd also get a discount from MSLN2. In other words, what that T1 would be costing us. So this would be the bottom line cost to the district per month for the ATM connection um, for that much per year. It would result in increasing the bandwidth for our data, and I think that's something that's going to be needed in the future, uh, plus all of the learning and the video and the audio capabilities. So it's, it's something I think we, we want to be looking at, and the groundwork is laid for that process. If that's if this is approved through funding and through local funding and through E-rate e funding. Hardware upgrades, each year we target a school. <coughs> this year was, year's, year's target was the high school. We replaced the, the Windows lab right next to the library. We replaced the Mac lab downstairs. We continue the rotation. Pond Cove should be the next lab to be replaced and, and work around the cycle. The, one, the computers that came out of the lab go elsewhere in the schools. Here's some current statistics of, of numbers, the kind of numbers that we're, we're dealing with, uh, computers and peripherals. Uh, it's becoming substantial. We've also, because of access problems uh, and, and people wanting more access, we piloted a, a mobile app this year. It's a, a cart that rolls into the classroom. It has 12 computers. And here you see some students in a Pond Cove classroom using it. It's little laptops, and they are connected to the internet wirelessly. No wires that you drape across. Um, the mobile lab, here's what it looks like. There's slots in here for the 12 computers. 
some networking stuff, and I've even put a printer on the top of it. So when you roll it into the classroom, it is, it is complete. It's a complete package. Uh, staff development. You saw some evidence of some of the, the results of the staff development in an earlier workshop when we met at the middle school lab and saw what some of the teachers had, had developed. Just wanted to share with you some of the numbers that the National Semiconductor Grants, we had 15 staff in one, 13, 15, and these were Saturday workshops. Granted, we were offering a small stipend, but I've, I've discovered that uh, offering some, some content that teachers really are interested in and offering some real dynamic speakers brings in people. And these people that taught these classes came back in the summer and we had a pretty good session. This was our best summer session uh, ever as far as attendance. I think we had 29 or 30 different, different staff members attend sessions all, along the way. The focus of staff development is moving away from this is how you use a computer or this is how you use a program to how do you incorporate this into your curriculum. Technology staffing, um, kind of broke it down into a couple of categories, professional staffing and technical staffing. Uh, professional staffing to assist the staff with the technology in the curriculum to incorporate it, incorporate technology into the curriculum. And it's happening more and more. Technology is just a tool that we're going to roll into the classroom and, oh, we're doing a project, a research project. We need to find some information. We roll in the mobile lab. We use that as just another tool to find some information. We have teachers versus ed techs. We have some ed techs in some labs that might be doing some teacher responsibilities. Do we need a teacher there that can help and assist the professional staff? We need the ed techs to do some of the technical stuff. And then uh, the technical support staff just to keep things running. The mobile lab has proved to be very popular, but it is another lab and it is another chunk of time we've opted to because we want this to be a success, to go into the classroom with the mobile lab first. So either my assistant or myself go to the classroom. We want to make sure things are working, at least for the first few times that people are using it. Um, the technology plan did call for additional staffing last year and this year. I just wanted to point that out. Uh, I begin the day, I have this database, this computer inventory database, and one part of it is my trouble calls. And this is just a little screenshot from this morning. Uh, starting at the beginning of August, I really religiously started keeping track um, the first day of school. But there's a, a section in here called trouble calls. Now a trouble call might be, you know, I can't print, or it might be we need to install something. Anytime that we have to get up and go to a, a place, it gets logged as a trouble call. Some trouble calls are five minutes, some are five hours, some might be five days that, you know, that we get back to. Well, here's where we are right now. This was this morning. There were 27 outstanding calls that day out of 481 since the beginning of August. So I've started keeping, and you can see the top one on the list there, Peter, workman snapped fiber optic cable. That's one that we're working on right now. But this is something that, this is how we determine our daily work log and our, our work list. Here are numbers, um, July and August. The, the blue is July and August. This is the total trouble calls for the school. You can see where September is a, a real rough month for us. We have a lot of, a lot of work in those months if you look at some of the numbers. Uh, total for the, for the month of July and August was 108, 164 in September. And now it's kind of leveling off, 98, 86. So it's, it's calming down some. But there's, there's a lot of work here for two people to deal with. Some things don't, some of the things that happen, for example, in the middle school that an ed tech at the middle school does don't even get entered into here. So there's a lot happening. I just want you to see that, see those numbers to see what's going on. Uh, staff are depending more on technology. Email seems to be, and, and that's evidenced by, by being without it for a while, the preferred means of communication. I know that when, uh, when some parents went to the high school for open house for the orientation at the beginning of the year, many of the teachers said, okay, this is how I prefer you to contact me. We have phones, voicemail, email, and that's what people are, are, are saying is their preferred means. 
We're using technology to do grading, special ed forms. We now have on a server, budgeting. Uh, network resources are critical. When things are down, it becomes uh, a big problem. And the web is becoming an important part of the curriculum. It's being used more and more. We're also using it to gather data. Tom did a little survey by way of the web, and it was went right into a database and, and can spit out a tally sheet with everything that you've got there. We have software to do that kind of stuff on our web server. So we're using the technology to help us with certain things. So issues that we need to think about, the access to, to technology still seems to be an issue. We are, we do have some older <coughs> technology in the classroom because we replaced the lab, we put the, the newest stuff in the lab where the students are, and then we move that three-year-old stuff out into the classroom. So I am getting some uh, comments by teachers that, you know, this classroom computer is old. We started the technology plan five, six years ago. We bought about 60 or so, 75 megahertz machines. Those were the biggest and, and the fastest then, but they're pretty slow nowadays. There is an increased demand on our networks, and we're we're getting more and more calls for professional development. Now that people have had a taste of what this can do, they want more of that. And staffing is a real critical issue. So that's, that's where we are. That's the state of technology. I'd be open to any questions or comments. Thank you, Gary. That was a good update. Are there questions um, by members of the board? Comments? I did include a little extra material in your packet. I included a copy of the plan so you could see where we were. There's more information, even though it's very, very fine prints on the ATM project in there. Um, and there's a, uh, a chapter on staff development, how teachers learn technology best. There's like 10 lessons that have been Excuse learned. me, Gary, can you hit the light on that? <laughs> you don't like that. You're <laughs> out. Your hair looks kind of nice purple, Kevin. <laughs> I'm sure it does, but I can't see it. <laughs> Thanks. So 10 lessons that other districts have learned about professional development and technology, but they're really good lessons about professional development in general. I just wanted to share that, that article. Questions or comments? George. Yep. I think we're in a good place, Gary. Thanks very much. Uh, keep reminding us, please, that we need to stay in that good place so we don't get complacent. And I think the um, the trouble calls and the um, and the request for more development is a it's a it's a really good sign. That's a that's a positive sign that um, technology is being used as a tool. So, and obviously we've got to continue to make sure that we're supporting that. That's a tremendous amount of, um, of uh, units to try and uh, be servicing and, you know, peripheral pieces and printers and all those other things. And, um, and I think that we recognize that um, it's tough with the resources that we have. And particularly as people use them more and more and explore and, and uh, um, involve more and more students with the technology. Um, it's only going to have, there's only going to be more trouble calls and m more need for development, for training. So I think it's a good sign. I've had the opportunity to serve on the Technology Steering Committee the last couple of years, and I just want to thank Gary because it's been a, a tremendous educational opportunity for myself. I, I've learned a lot about technology and a, a lot about the way the schools run their technology, and uh, you do a great job. Thanks, Gary. Thank I'm sure we'll be talking more um, as we go through the budget process. I suspect we'll see some of those slides again. <laughs> just, just a hunch. I don't know. Um, I'll set to move on from there. We will move to um, the principal's reports and start with Peter, high school.
Nancy, Tom, and I have decided that we yielded our time to the gentleman from the technology department. <laughs> <laughs> you wish. <laughs> uh, I do want to take this opportunity. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I do want to take this opportunity uh, for any of those that are, that are listening to emphasize a point that Gary made uh, regarding a problem that we do have in the high school right now is that our email system is out. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, if people from outside are sending email to us, there's no indication that the message is not received. So we have received a few uh, phone calls from people upset saying I've, I've emailed three times and I've, gotten, I've received no response from you uh, and we aren't getting those at this point. Uh, so, uh, so I would appeal to any of those listening to uh, a little bit of patience. We're hoping that this will be fixed fairly quickly. We're kind of at the mercy of delivery of materials at this point. I think they'll act quickly once they have the proper materials, but we're waiting delivery. Um, a lot of things happening. Uh, Sarah pointed out uh, some of the things that have been going on. We did, uh, as I had reported at the last meeting, uh, but now it's uh, uh, after the fact, we did begin the first step of our uh, uh, of attacking our theme of civility and respect, I think with great success. We had a an full school assembly on last Friday with Steve Wessler from the Center for the Study and Prevention of Hate Violence from USM coming, presenting uh, to the entire student body and faculty. Uh, followed by roundtable discussions that were led by, uh, facilitated by students. Um, I think we took a real good first step, and, and there's a lot to build uh, upon. Uh, the students that I've talked with were uh, generally very favorably impressed. There were frustrations, uh, and I think those frustrations are because of the very high expectation uh, that they and we have uh, for. Uh, the uh, behavior related to this, this issue. The frustrations were that, oh, somebody in my group still was saying, no, it's okay to, uh, to put down certain groups or this type of thing. And, and certainly our goal was not to uh, change that behavior in a day. Uh, we, we hope to keep making steady uh, progress, but uh, I think it was a very good start and I'd like to public, publicly thank uh, uh, Belinda Snell and Katie Lisa who were the two um, uh, staff members that have um, worked uh, since last spring to uh, put this together, both in terms of the training of uh, student facilitators and the uh, uh, finding of Steve Wessler as a, an outstanding resource. And uh, I, I feel like it's been a very good first step, and I'd like to thank Katie and Belinda for their work. Um, another area that has, has uh, been a result of uh, uh, a lot of work and, and a lot of generosity. Uh, and I'd like to invite all of you uh, to the fruition of this with the grand opening uh, ceremony for the climbing wall will be this Saturday from 1.30 to until 3.30. Uh, as you are aware, uh, all of the climbing wall uh, has been paid for by uh, outside of the, uh, has been paid for outside of the normal school budget. Uh, it's been paid for by generous donations from uh, such donors as the Charles Chase Company, the Cape Coalition, the uh, Class of 99 Project Graduation, the Cape Elizabeth High School Parents Association, and the Class of 2000 all made very important uh, donations to make this work. Uh, I think it's important to, to also recognize that uh, Andrea Kayer and, and Jake Jackson uh, put in a lot of uh, planning uh, and time and uh, Scott Shea uh, has shown uh, a very special dedication to this project since the very beginning. Uh, it was uh, his vision to begin with, and uh, it's one more uh, piece to, I think, a uh, uh, physical education and health program that make an awful lot of sense to me. Uh, they put in a tremendous amount of work. So I'd invite you all at 1.30 on uh, Saturday uh, to come to the uh, ribbon cutting, final ribbon cutting. Do they have to be prepared to climb? Uh, you are invited to wear uh, uh, shorts uh, or, or uh, flexible clothing and, uh, and uh, sneakers of some sort. <laughs> I will not be partaking because <laughs> I'm terrified of heights. <laughs> uh, good reason to get on it, I guess. Uh, our mock trial uh, team just finished up their season yesterday, and I wanted to, uh, to mention the, the, the great success that they enjoyed. 
Uh, they took it all the way to the state finals this year. Yesterday, the state finals were played out in the county courthouse, Kennebec County Courthouse in Augusta, uh, where our team uh, competed with the team from Hamden Academy. Uh, what a wonderful thing to watch. Uh, the the uh, Both teams were clearly so well prepared, uh, showed such poise, such fluency with both the law and the uh, the legal procedures, uh, courtroom procedures. Uh, I, I, I know that the judges must have gone through a tremendous amount of hair splitting to determine uh, a winner. It turned out that Hamden Academy uh, was judged the, the winner. Uh, both teams uh, just, uh, I thought, performed uh, at, at a level that was just very impressive. Dr. Forsella also uh, attended a would guess that he shares uh, my views on that. It was uh, wonderful to watch. So uh, people like the, our, our faculty advisor uh, for that uh, activity was Dick Mullen. Uh, and then uh, particular gratitude, I think, is owed to uh, John Chapman and Nancy Siegler, who were volunteer parent uh, coaches uh, of that team. They provided all of the legal uh, expertise uh, Dick uh, was the uh, advisor and providing a good deal of the expertise in presentation and poise and so forth. And certainly our students showed plenty of that. Uh, finally, uh, coming up the, this Monday, another invitation to all of you. This will be our winter concert. Uh, uh, Monday evening, 7.30 p.m. It will be both the instrumental and choral music uh, concert uh, for the high school. And uh, that is always a great show, and I, I encourage uh, as many of you as possible to, uh, to attend. We'll be uh, offering a short version of that concert the following day as an assembly for the student body, a chance for them to appreciate uh, the, the extremely high level that uh, our students perform at. I think that's it. Thanks, Pete. Um, questions or comments? Link. Um, Quick question. Uh, I know that you've had some parents uh, uh, who would come to you to speak about uh, adding Latin to the curriculum for next year. Um, can you explain where you're at in working with these parents? And yes, uh, we we met and and uh, discussed um, uh, you know discussed the the possibilities of adding that. Um, at the time that I met with them, I was thinking of surveying. Uh, students uh, to see what the interest level would be and then realize that that would be somewhat fruitless uh, given the fact that it would be in a vacuum. There, there may be, this, as uh, you heard Sarah mention, the Student Council uh, is uh, developing a list of uh, electives that they might like to see offered also and are in the process of meeting with um, department heads to, to see what the chances of uh, those offerings would be. And so my plan at this point would be to um, list Latin with the courses that are offered at pre-registration time and see who signs up. As I say, I, uh, in, in trying to think of whether to just send out a survey and say, would you be signing up for Latin, uh, I, I believe that the student response would be as compared to what? Uh, and they need to see the, uh, uh, the total picture and make their choices. So uh, my plan, as I say at this point, and I was uh, encouraged to hear that this, the SAC uh, had Latin uh, on their uh, list as one of the electives that they thought were worth exploring at least. And so our plan at this point would be to offer it like any other course that we offer um, and uh, see whether people sign up for it or not. And that would be Latin Yes. Thanks. Um, not to get um, too off track on this one issue, but um, then Pete, correct me if I'm wrong, because I had I had sort of responded to someone on this. Um, that would be a preliminary indication that yes, there is enough interest, and then there would be a budget piece of that, which would which would have some implications, perhaps in terms of of um, adding an, an additional course, adding perhaps some additional resources. Because I encouraged some of the parents who contacted me to follow it th through to the, to the budget piece of it and understand that there are, um, there are sometimes trade-offs, there are additional resources that are required, and that there is sort of a budgetary um, consideration also. So, I mean, is that? 
Uh, yes, it Act can be, and, 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 as, you, as you know uh, from the past, my position generally at budget time, uh, because of the timing, is to come and uh, ask for uh, uh, you know, additional fifths if necessary to handle some possible uh, additions, and then you've been uh, very supportive of the concept of saying, okay, we will add uh, two tenths or four tenths or whatever, um, and you decide where you're going to uh, need them. Uh, sometimes it breaks out that there's, uh, uh, that there's a trade-off, that okay, yes, while we added this new section of math, uh, we found that it cut into uh, this other old section of math that we didn't need as many sections, or it, uh, as it turned out, we didn't need uh, some other course. So we've, uh, it, it sometimes does have a budgetary implication and it can certainly have personnel implications. And, and so forth. We've been just doing a little bit of preliminary work to see if there's anybody on our staff uh, that is certified in Latin. I don't believe that we have anybody at this point that is uh, certified to teach Latin. We do have people that have some background um, in Latin from either, yeah, from, from their university studies. Mm -hmm. We're trying not to go back to those that had two years of Latin in high school. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I had four. Ms. <laughs> 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 <Ms>. Bruns. <laughs> okay. Any other questions or comments for Pete? Thank you. Um, move on to the middle school, Nancy. I thought I was going to get out of this because Pete told me we we're going to yield our time to Gary, and I thought it was a terrific idea. Um, but Pete, if that was your concept of yielding time, we need to talk about that kind of thing. Uh, since our last meeting, uh, we have had our fall concerts. They were a great success. Um, the students really showed their growth and uh, the results of the dedication of those hard practices um, that they've done. Also, everyone seemed to have fun. One of the great joys for me of attending these concerts is to really watch the students, how they get into their singing and how they get into playing their various instruments. Um, so it always was terrific. And I really thank Joanne Lee and Terry White, as well as all of the students, for their hard work. During November, when we had the professional development days, we continued our work on assessment. And just to quickly update you on that, on the Monday, um, the teachers worked in their grade level teams to correct the assessments that they had done that I've spoken about several times during our meetings. And then we looked, we went through a process of what did we find out that was of value to us and how are we going to use that to impact our instruction. In grades five, six, and eight, they all did assessments, some to do with grammar. And they have collected that information. Um, and they're going to be using it to inform some of their practices, especially in grades five and six, with their daily oral language lessons. And at all three grade levels, they will be giving those assessments again um, at least one other time this year in their language arts classes and just managed by the language arts teachers at that time. So this was something the grade level worked on together, developed, went over the rubric, uh, found a feedback system to work for the students. I believe all the students have now heard back from those assessments and they will use it and it will become part of their practice and something that they will use in their classes. The seventh grade worked on a study skills challenge with them and they will be doing similar kinds of things, although not that same assessment again because they will move on to some other um, kinds of things, but that really informed them some of the study skills that they want to emphasize and some of the things that they really feel comfortable that the students can build upon. We then move forward with our assessment discussion to what will we do next, and we have now decided to align ourselves into content area groups. These are five through eight assortments, and we have only done the first step, which is just to brainstorm some of the things we might like to look at in assessments for those. Um, for the students ahead in that, it's not that like the social studies group will do a social studies assessment at every grade level. They will more likely probably pick a particular grade level to do a social studies assessment on and use that as something to inform our practice in the middle school. And we haven't made the decision yet exactly what we'll do. They've just brainstormed and we will use our early release afternoons in January and March to work on those um, assessments and use the staff development day in April for scoring and correcting. Um, also, since our last thing, our seventh grade has gone to Kiev. It was an extremely successful um, time at Kiev this year. Um, we also had 100, approximately 130 parents who came to the parent day on Wednesday. Um, that was a great success for us. One of our challenges that 
sort of Charlie Harrington, who is one of the leaders of the leadership group at Kiev, put forth to the parents without perhaps realizing that he was, he informed them at their informational meeting in October that Falmouth had sent 88 parents, and that was the largest number of parents that had ever come to Kiev. Um, immediately in our own culture of Cape Elizabeth, we turned that into a challenge that we would certainly at least get 89 parents there. Um, and the seventh grade parents came forward and accomplished that goal, and we got 130. More importantly than the number is the activities that they were involved in that day and the networking that they began to build upon um, to help for parenting of emerging adolescents and also to make it a safe and productive time as their children go through from seventh grade and beyond. Um, in the parents newsletter that has just going out, I've written about that and asked for even further suggestions that we might help them <coughs> to continue this parent network and to build on the Kiev experience. Already back at school for the Kiev experience, the seventh grade team of advisors has gotten together and they're working on a respect um, activity with the students um, in these next few weeks. They have a closing date for that particular activity towards the end before the December break, but then they'll assess that and see what else that they can do because they would like to build on the positive learnings that the students made at Kiev and make it a real part of how we go to school in the seventh grade in Cape Elizabeth. And I think that just about covers what's going on in the middle school. Okay. Questions or comments? Um, Nance, do you remember two years ago when we first went to Kiev, did we have about 30 or 40? We, we did have about, I think we've, the, other two, the first year we went, we had 35 to 40. Okay. The next year we had sort of 40 to 45. Mm -hmm. um, and then this year, of course, we have a very large seventh grade this right, year as well, right. too. But I think also what has happened is, um, the word has gotten out, and now Kiev is becoming a part of what we do, and the strength of that parent day. Um, it is a great day to go and to check in with your child, but it also is even a stronger day to come and check in with parents. We're also picking up more parents who are riding the bus, and so that's a whole hour and a half up and back to um, chat about just things going on. Um, with your son or daughter and connecting with people. And the interesting thing today in our parents association meeting, people talked about that yes, you see the parents, you see it a lot of activities, but also you see some parents you have not had an opportunity to meet before at this event. And so it is really a strong networking I, way to I do that. I was surprised, I mean, in, you know, this is the eighth year that class has been together. There were people mm -hmm. there I had never seen before. Mm -hmm. right. And you sort of thought you'd <laughs> at least know faces of of most of those parents, so it was really, it was nice to mm -hmm. see that many people. We were pretty packed in, so it was warm, too. <laughs> right. It was, and um, I have talked with Charlie Harrington. One of the things, this may or may not happen, but just to let people know, ever since we've gone to Kiev and we've had that week right after Thanksgiving, that is the week we are tentatively booked in for next year as well. But Charlie has always known we'd like to go earlier if possible, and he does have a week that will open up, um, he believes, this is all tentative, so here we are, if, if, if. But he believes it will open up either the third or fourth week of September, and we are the second school on the list with the right of refusal. There is a school ahead of us, and we also first have to wait to see if that week really does open up. So, um, But he is working on that. However, it, interestingly enough, this being our third year that we've gone to, we have found that some of the things about the week right after Thanksgiving work very well for us, mm -hmm. which even though initially we were concerned, we wished it could have been earlier. Um, there are some things that are very positive, and the seventh grade team has talked about it. They would prefer the September date. However, there are a number of people on the team, I think four, who said either one works really well. Um, and there are three people who would prefer the November date. So um, there are good things that come out of all of this, and the timing of it um, did not turn out to be so bad. So even if we end up with November still, it will work for us, and it will be a very productive time. Maybe you could uh, suggest that they prioritize based on the number of parents that uh, show <laughs> Yeah, uh, That would be an excellent bargaining chip, George. <laughs> um, any other questions or comments? We're all set. Thank you, Nancy. Um, and Pond Cove, Tom. Good evening. Um, I just wanted to mention, uh, put a few things in context, a little broader perhaps than I usually do, that over the past couple of years, the district has really given a high priority to supporting 
professional development time. And Nancy and Pete and I have told you, I think, repeatedly about the success of the five-hour day. But there, there are other things happening uh, for use of teacher time for professional development. Right before our Thanksgiving um, week, which included teacher, two teacher days, I think I mentioned we were trying the experiment. We had it set up to give every Pond Cove teacher the opportunity to visit another classroom teacher to see specific activities we're working on to improve uh, in reading and writing. And that turned out to be a, a tremendous success. It seems like a simple thing to do, but simply getting out visiting another room proved to be successful. The other dimension we added was, was a little uh, structured professional time during the day so that people who visited could go to the teacher's room, look over printed material, talk to each other uh, about things they'd just seen. One piece we couldn't add because of scheduling um, impracticalities was the visiting teachers talking to the, to the host teacher, but we were able to do, to, to do that the following week. It, it turned out to be such a good thing to do. The literacy committee is going to, we're meeting again tomorrow, it's our regular meeting, to try to do this on a more regular basis instead of waiting and making a big production about it. Also on Saturday, November 18th, 11 teachers went to Everyday Math, Chicago Math Conference in Boston. It's unusual for 11 teachers from Pond Cove to go anywhere together, but um, particularly on a Saturday. So there was, uh, I think the atmosphere has changed so that uh, with the rising expectations for professional development, people are taking advantage of it more. And it turned out that by going together, uh, a little bonding occurred. Then they made the mistake of letting me know how good it was. So we uh, spent some time at a faculty meeting sharing some very specific tips strategies, things to look for in the new material about Chicago math, things that probably wouldn't have happened had they not gone together. For years, we've been looking for ways uh, to help people plug in when they've gone to a workshop or a professional development activity, and I think we're on the right track. Um, the third thing that happened in November was um, you saw slides of the mobile lab that we're sharing with the middle school. Gary Lenoy came over, um, gave up a day, I think, to meet with each grade level team during their common planning time to get them started with the nuts and bolts of using the mobile lab and then fielded questions about how this would happen in the classroom. And after just a 45 minute period of peace with each, each grade level, uh, e each one has now scheduled time to have the mobile lab at Pond Cove with uh, curriculum goals in mind. So I want to thank Gary and the teachers for doing that. And third, and lastly, a smaller thing, the uh, Media Center this year has started out with kind of be a, a nice tradition of having a chuckboard outside the Media Center with a gentle question every day, you know, how many, which months have 30 days, what's your favorite pet? Last week's question was, when will the first snow day be? And I think there were votes for every day from when the question went up until <laughs> next Friday. So I, I, I want to remind Tom that the pressure is on. So <laughs> let us know what you're thinking. <laughs> Any questions? We're all set. Thank Thanks. you, Tom. OK, we're going to move on to committee reports. Um, and we'll start with um, Kevin, Finance C Subcommittee. Finance Committee met tonight. Uh, we got a little good news, uh, the first being that the state has agreed to defray at least part of the purchase of a new school bus. So uh, that certainly is good news. We reviewed the capital improvement plan uh, for the next, uh, for the coming years, and uh, have agreed that that should be forwarded on to Mike McGovern. Um, of course, pending any adjustments that be, may be made through subsequent meetings with uh, the folks at SMRT. Um, and for those who don't know who that is, those are our advisors on the uh, on uh, faculties planning, uh, the engineers and architects. And uh, finally, we discussed uh, the PASS budget and the new program at PASS, which I'll report on later and um, a change uh, in the Constitution for PASS, which we will be dealing with on the new business. And of course, we reviewed and signed all of the warrants so that all of our vendors would be paid. Thanks, Kevin. Um, Jennifer, uh, Policy Subcommittee. Um, the Policy Subcommittee met, what was the date? I can't remember. Um, 
December 3rd, 4th, something like that. Unfortunately, I didn't write that down. Six. Last Wednesday, anyway. Um, and we continued our review of um, our whole policy manual working on sections D, E, and F. Um, and we will continue that next month. Uh, and we began to gather information on various athletic policies because we'll be working on those in the future. And our next meeting is January 3rd, Wednesday, in the Jordan Conference Room at 12 noon. Is that athletic booster policies or athletic eligibilities? Um, no, it's not eligibility. It'll be more like the contract um, and fundraising. fundraising and, um, and what was the date on that one? I'm sorry, what? What was the date on the, the date, next meeting? The um, date is uh, the 3rd at 12 noon. Oh, I'm sorry, that's right. It should be on the agenda. Okay, thank you. Um, facilities Committee, Marie? Um, our final uh, meeting with SMRT, with the Facilities Committee and SMRT will be this Thursday, December 14th, at 7 o'clock in the Community Services Room. And um, the Facilities Committee will receive um, and discuss the final recommendations from SMRT. Um, after this meeting, we have scheduled for January 4th at 7 o'clock in the um, Pine Cove uh, Middle School Cafetorium, a public meeting. Um, SMRT will run that meeting. We will have um, the final recommendation in terms of the space needs, and that is the time that we would like input from the public, from all members of the community. Um, and then on January 9th, is when we will take all of this information and bring it back to the board um, for discussion and the proposed option. And it'll be discussion at our meeting then. Okay. And all board members are invited to, to Thursday's, this Thursday's meeting, meeting at 7. <coughs> and you said that's in the uh, community services room? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, and added here is um, the mm -hmm. Portland uh, uh, the path, I forget exactly what it was. Um. Portland Arts and Technical High School. Right. Um, I, I have a, a quick report that I'd like to bring to everyone's attention, and that is the upgrade of the machine tools program at Portland Arts and Technical High School in conjunction with the Maine Metal Products Association and in partnership with a number of private businesses. Um, the expansion and improvement of this program is the result of our being approached by these private manufacturers and the, uh, the Trade Council uh, and saying we have 1,400 very highly paying jobs, uh, jobs that can pay sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 a year, and we have nobody feeding people into the, uh, the programs. Um, so we are investing $34,000 as pass into that program to expand it so that we can, in fact, say, serve uh, 32 students a year in, the, in that training program, which is essentially a pre-apprenticeship program, preparing them to move on to, uh, to the two-year technical colleges and the four-year colleges. Uh, these are uh, very technical positions CAD, involving CAD CAM, Although it's felt that the, uh, the there are opportunities for the less than tr traditional students uh, in these things, um, just to give you an idea, uh, this is the only manufacturing sector in the state of Maine that is increasing at the rate of 10 to 15 percent a year. Um, it's a partnership. I, I think it's exciting. Um, there are a lot of good opportunities out there. Um, and I'd like you uh, to go back to your guidance councils and let them know, uh, pro, you know, on a preliminary basis, um, that this program is being expanded, um, and there there are some uh, opportunities there. That uh, you know, keep, uh, if we're interested, if we have people out there in the slightest bit interested, uh, should jump in and get on the bandwagon now. And that's it for uh, pass. Thanks, Kevin. Um, 
Unfinished business is next on the agenda. Um, none, then we're going to move on to uh, new business. And uh, we revised the agenda to um, put on a student matter which requires um, a public motion. And earlier this evening, we um, had a hearing um, to look at the expulsion or to consider um, the expulsion of a high school student. And I believe that there is a motion that's come forward. Jim? Uh, I would uh, at this time move for the expulsion of a high school student uh, in order to preserve the peace and uh, a positive learning environment at the school. Okay. And is there a second on this? Marie? Um, any comments, questions? And I, I may just provide a very brief sort of sense about it. Um, we heard uh, a hearing, which of course um, has to do with a student matter, which is confidential. Um, had an opportunity to hear from our administrators and um, the involved student um, and representatives for that student. And the board unanimous, unanimously made the determination that expulsion of the student was appropriate. Um, as Jim says um, in the wording of the motion, uh, to preserve the, the peace and what is it? Peace and usefulness, usefulness of the school. Um, and um, all of, it's a very a difficult situation, probably the least favorite activity um, that any board member gets involved in. Um, but as I said, it was um, uh, the board was of fairly uh, like mind in terms of um, reviewing this particular issue. Um, I'm going to call for a, any other comments or questions about this matter. Um, all those in favor? I have a comment. Oh, I'm sorry. Is there a comment? Okay, hold on. Go ahead, Peter. That's okay. Um, while we were discussing it, it did occur to me that it, that it is worth noting that in many expulsion hearings, obviously the person who has been handling uh, much of the uh, uh, discipline with the particular student uh, is looked at very negatively because they are uh, the bearers of, of bad news often. I think it's worth noting that uh, in this case, uh, the person who has handled uh, the disciplinary uh, responses with this student uh, for the last year and a half, uh, who is the assistant principal, Dwight Ely, um, it was held, it was so clear that he was held in extremely high regard by both uh, parent and student. And I think that's kind of a rare occasion when you're sitting in an expulsion hearing to hear the very high regard that they had uh, for the person that had been dealing with uh, the student for a year and a half. And I think I wanted to note that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's important. Other comments, questions, then calling for a vote. All those in favor? Seven zero. That will go on the um, the public record of this meeting. Moving on now to um, other new business is uh, consideration of the re-election of the superintendent of schools. This, um, Tom, we we kind of get some direct direction on this from the um, Department of Education. From you. We need direction from you. <laughs> well, you, you hit, decide whether they're going to. You do read. have a you do have a memo from the commissioner of education, and, and and this is something that the board is required to undertake during the month of of December. Uh, it's an annual certification, um, either when a new superintendent is selected or an existing superintendent's contract um, is extended. This is not to be confused with the annual evaluation of the superintendent, which is something we would uh, undertake at the end of the school year. Right. So you're basically saying it's, it's a formality that each board needs to go through um, following sort of the legal obligation to elect their superintendent. So with that, um, we, I, I guess I would call for a motion. Kevin. I move that we are re-elect Dr. Thomas Fosseller as superintendent of schools for the Cape Elizabeth School District. Okay. And a second, Jim. Uh, questions or comments? I think we're all very happy to do this, Tom. <laughs> um, even, if it, even if it is just a formality, it's meaningful for us. Um, all those in favor? 7-0. Okay. Um, consideration. I enjoyed that feat. <laughs> uh, was there comments? Yeah. Um, 
consideration of a proposed Nordic ski tr uh, trip, Nordic ski trip uh, to Pinkham Notch, New Hampshire. And there's um, information in the packet um, for all board members uh, in, in terms of the um, specifics of this trip. Um, any, any comments? Um, this is not unlike other athletic trips the baseball right. team has taken and soccer teams um, in their preseason or during their, their seasons. Right, to be, um, to be chaperoned by the, the coaches, I know. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we have all of the details that we need. Anybody have any questions? No. Um, I think we do need a motion on this in terms of approval of the Nordic ski trip to New Hampshire because it goes out of state. Right. Jennifer? I move that we approve the proposed Nordic ski trip to Pinkham Notch, New Hampshire. Thank you. Second? Marie, thanks. Um, questions or comments? And seeing none, all those in favor? 7-0. Uh, move on to the approval of the PATHS budget uh, for the year 2001. Kevin, you want to present Mary, that? Mary, just to clarify, uh, the agenda item that's already on the agenda is for the Part 1 budget? Right. Okay, and I added the... Right. Okay. Um, the, uh, by law, we are required... Uh, to pay a portion of the total expenses it pass for the operating costs. Um, quickly in past history, that was changed. It used to be borne almost entirely by Portland. We passed special legislation to more equitably distribute those costs. Our costs prior to reimbursement by the state for uh, the year is going to be $76,528.49, which we need to, uh, to uh, accept at this point, and that cannot be, uh, well, legally, we, we have to fund this in our budget regardless of what, what may come. Mm -hmm. I just want to make that clear. So this, we've got a couple of um, paths-related issues on the, in this new business. Now, this is what you're saying is is um, this is a part, part one of, of the budget right. that we've reviewed earlier. Okay, and and we need a motion. Do you want to present that? I move that we adopt the figure of seventy-six thousand five hundred and twenty-eight dollars and forty-nine cents as our portion of the uh, operate part one cost for pass for the coming year. Okay, second. Um, Susan, thanks. Questions or comments? There yeah, question. Jennifer? It's got fiscal year 2001. Is that 2001, 2002, or 2000, 2001? That's 2001, 2000. Thank you, Mary. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. OK, all those in favor? Other questions? Sorry. Any other? Um, all those in favor? 7 0. And Kevin, let's just move right to the next um, paths issue. Sure. There is a part two cost which can be rejected by the board, uh, and that is our portion of that is $5,665.05. I've already described what most of that is for, and that's for the improvements and enhancements to the machine tool program. Some of the other things are uh, replacing a, a very aged tractor for the horticulture program. Uh, we are responsible for a piece of all the capital improvements and new program improvements. This what this represents. The past general advisory committee voted on this last week with a recommendation to our home boards that this be adopted. Any single school board can kill this uh, this particular item, um, and that's the background on that. And I would move that we adopt the Part 2 cost of $5,665.05 for the 2001 and 02 uh, fiscal year. Okay. A second? Marie? Um, co comments, questions? Seeing none, all those in favor? 7-0. And let's move on um, also to the amendment. Finally, the Constitution had a timeline for adopting budget items which left us in a very tight situation if any member of the General Advisory Committee voted against the budget or if any home board subsequently voted against the budget. 
anyone anyone sending district uh, can put the process right back. It would be like watching Florida, I guess, um, having one district send the entire budget back to be reviewed by uh, 12 other districts. Um, so we've just this is just an amendment to the Constitution to give us a little brief a little more breathing space that puts a final date of February 15th on the process. Therefore, I move that we adopt the change in the Constitution as recommended by the General Advisory Committee of Portland Arts and Technical High School. Okay, thanks. Second. Susan, comments, questions? Seeing none, all those in favor? 7-0. I would ask Mary if you would take the time tomorrow to convey to uh, the director of PASS that we have adopted those things and then pass along something in writing. Okay. Thank Thanks. You. Um, and then uh, we have consideration of appointments uh, to the Community Services Advisory Board. Tom. The school board um, has two appointments that they have to the um, come forward to the Community Services Advisory Board. Um, and the two names that are recommended are Sharon uh, Roberts and Judy Rowe. Okay. And in our packets, um, there are some brief bios and um, sort of a, a, a little bit of a sketch of a resume on um, these two uh, folks who are recommended. And the, uh, the town manager and uh, one of the town council members did go through the process, and I guess that's the procedure that they did talk to the candidates and hold an interview process. Okay. Mr. And Chairman, uh, given the fact that I've cast my lot in life with one of the uh, nominees, uh, it's probably appropriate that I recuse myself from voting. And we'll, we'll allow you to do that, Mr. Rowe. Um, we need a motion um, for uh, the acceptance of the uh, recommended appointments to the Community Services Advisory Board. Maybe I shouldn't recuse myself. <laughs> <laughs> Before you recuse yourself, you can make you a make motion. Uh, <laughs> Susan, do you want to? Uh, uh, I move that we um, accept the recommendations of the two um, candidates for the Community Services Advisory Board. Okay, thank you. Second, Marie. Um, any questions, comments? Um, all those in favor? It's six and one abstaining. Or recused, I'm not sure if there's a difference. Um, I think that completes the uh, business agenda items. It just dates to remember that are important. Um, there is a facilities committee meeting this Thursday evening in the community services room, 7 p.m. It's the final meeting with uh, SMRT. Um, the regular school board meeting will be preceded by the finance subcommittee meeting on January 9th, 2001 at 630 and that will be followed by the regular school board at 730 here in the council chambers. Um, policy subcommittee meeting is at noon on Wednesday, January 3rd um, and that's in the William Jordan conference room and on January 4th uh, there is a public meeting with regard to space needs presented by SMRT. And again, the location of that, Marie? The cafetorium at the middle school. At the cafetorium in the middle school, and that's, that's at 7 p.m.? Yes. Okay. Um, with those uh, dates to remember uh, reviewed, that concludes the business for this meeting, and thank you very much.